Hello everyone, I'm Rebecca and welcome back to my channel. Today I am finally going back to a series that I have been doing for a really long time on this channel but took a break with the last few months and that is examining an antique garment. So this little lady right here, and I really do mean little, really little, like she does not remotely fit my small dress form. This little lady right here is actually a bodice from the 1860s. So it is one of the oldest pieces in my collection. I have three 1860s pieces in my collection and that's as old as it goes. So I am very, very excited to show this to you today. And the reason that I picked this bodice for this month is because next week I am actually going to be going back to the mid Victorian era myself in my next project. And I'm going to be making an 18 50s dress. And also next week you are going to see a deep dive video that is going to talk about the fashion evolution of the 1850s from 1850 through 1859. And then next month I'm planning to do one on the 1860s, 1860 through 1869, so that you can see year by year how fashion changed. So I wanted to kind of kick off this whole series with this bodice right here. So again, and she is so, so tiny. This has got to be one of the smallest pieces in my collection. I mean, just tiny. But she is also in fabulous condition. Like, considering the fact that this is 160 years old, like, it looks like, you know, someone could have made her a couple years ago. She is just in the most wonderful condition. So I cannot wait to show this to you. Let's go ahead and take a quick zoom in look and see all of her little details. So because she does not remotely fit on the dress form, we're just going to look at her flat here. So the first thing that I want to point out is this gorgeous fabric. This is almost like a brown shot blue. You can see that blue almost iridescence coming up in here. And because she's in such good condition, there's really no raw edges that I can look at to see the different weave, like where blue might be actually in there. But also she's got these gorgeous textured brown stripes on here. It's almost like they feel like a satin stitch but very flat to the weave. Just really absolutely gorgeous on there and they've picked up the brown and the blue in the trim. So there's not too much trim on this bodice but we do have this absolutely wonderful fringe on both the sleeves and there was also a piece right here that came with this. I got this at the bargain basement at Costume College by the way several years ago but this piece right here is so fascinating and honestly I'm not entirely positive where on the bodice this goes but it is trimmed with the same wonderfully delicate orange and blue trim here, fringe here. So that is just so neat looking. And I mean, if you saw my haul video from a couple of weeks ago, you know that I do like orange and blue combo. So I think that that's really cute that that's on there. So the bodice has pretty simple construction. It has a pretty typical sleeve for the 1860s where it starts that it's fitted into this really, really kind of dropped off the shoulder arms eye right here and then it comes out a little bit by the elbow and then back into a narrow end down at the cuff. It doesn't have a separate cuff, it is just piped with very, very delicate piping at the edge and then that piping is turned to the inside and stitched down by hand, of course, into the inside of the sleeve. So again, this sleeve type is very, very common in the 1860s. It's probably like the most popular type of sleeve that you see in the era. And we also have that tiny narrow piping right up here at the arm side as well. They still really loved piping in the 1860s. It was kind of, I almost feel like, like the last time that they really used that. And the dropped shoulder is also very common in the 1860s. You see that throughout the entire decade. And it was a holdover from earlier decades as well. This, by the way, is a two-piece sleeve. I don't think you can get this shape without it being a two-piece sleeve, but we have one one seam on this side, one seam on that side. So you can see how it all goes into the arm's eye together there. The fringe, by the way, is only on the front side. I think that that's interesting. I don't know if they maybe didn't have a lot of it, but it is not on the underside of the sleeve, just on the front side. 
So looking at the bodice front here, again, we have very, very typical of the era, very high neck. This neck is just bound with some of the fabric, not actually with bias of the fabric. If you notice, see the stripes there, they are just kind of continuing straight. That is a straight strip that they've used for the binding, which is why it's all ripply here as well. And the bodice construction is also very standard for this era. We've got two darts on each side here, nipping it in at the waist. And then the button front closure. I think it's interesting that the buttons start pretty high up. There is no buttonhole down here. And that is one of the reasons why I think that this piece may be a belt, but I'm honestly not positive. So we've got our hand done buttonholes. You can see all of those. No buttons left, unfortunately, but you can see all of the places where there were once buttons. The bottom down here is again bound with just a straight strip of the main fabric, just like the neckline. The back of the bodice, I would actually say, is a little bit less typical of the era. A lot of times in this era, you see seams coming in right here, and that gives us kind of this narrow piece in the back that I've heard is called a fiddle back, and it just comes down into kind of a little narrow bit with side back pieces here. Instead, what we're seeing here is that the front piece actually wraps around just a little bit to the back, so there is just three pieces in this bodice. There's the back and then there's two fronts. And this is the seam where they meet. And likewise, at the shoulder, it also comes up and around. This is common. This is very common for the shoulder to come over and you get that when you're looking at a fiddle back. But the fact that there is no side back piece here, that's a little bit less common. The one other thing that I find interesting on the back is this random row of hand stitching right here. I'm not sure why it's there. When we go and we look at the inside, I'll show you that it doesn't really seem to be doing anything. So yeah, I don't know why that hand stitching is there. The one other thing that I want to point out before we move to the inside is that there are these two little thread loops right here. They're very well constructed. These are like chunky thread loops and I'm not sure what they go with if they were maybe for the skirt or decoration. There are no thread loops on this potential belt piece and I say potential because again I really don't know necessarily what it was for. At first when I first got this I thought maybe it would like wrap around the neck and then come down the fronts like a shawl but it's straight. It really does not curve. Like if we lay this out it is almost a completely straight piece that is just wider here than it is down here. So it can fit well as a belt, like it does have some lap over, it's wider than the waist or longer than the waist. So it would maybe cross over the front. There's no closures or anything on here and really no evidence of closures. It's just lined with this sort of rough like very open weave fabric. I'm honestly not even sure what fabric this is, if this is like a tarlatan gone bad or what, but yeah, it's just lined with that and then just bound at the top. So the one other thing that maybe this could be for, if there was another one at some point, would be to do a decoration that comes down here goes up over the shoulder and then comes down in the back. Likewise, it is the perfect length for that. And also that was a common look that you really saw a lot in the 1850s and early 1860s. So it's possible that maybe that was used there kind of like as a transitional element. I'm really not sure. It's hard to say exactly when in the 1860s this was. This sort of sleeve really started to come into popularity in, I wanna say like 1862-ish, somewhere in there. And uh, yeah, it's possible that this decoration, which was still being used at the time, could have maybe been related to that if there was a pair of them. So another one would be right here. So let's go ahead and open her up and take a look at the insides. So we can see in here that she is lined with brown cotton, which is really kind of the most common thing that you see in any of the Victorian era. What I find quite interesting is that it actually has a sort of 
I don't want to call it a waste stay, but that's basically the function that it is serving so that there's no pressure that is put, no strain that is put on the buttonhole closure over here. We have a hook and eye panel that instead comes and closes inside right there and that way there's none of that strain put there so we can see this has a weird placement of the eyes on it we've got two of the eyes here and then the other eyes are right at the edge there and likewise with our hooks we have the two hooks here at the edge and then there were once they're no longer there but there were once three that were right here as well on the inside, we also have a little bit of shaping to this center back panel. I'm not sure why it was necessary on the inside and not on the outside, but you can see that we have just a little bitty dart, tiny little narrow dart in the center. There is also one piece of boning in basically the side seam here. So this is the side seam right here. And then we've got hand stitching that is creating a boning channel within the seam allowance. So just one little piece of boning, doesn't go quite up to the arm's eye because of course you don't want to poke yourself in the underarm. And you can also see that the lining here in the sleeve is a different fabric. So this one is like a more open weave cotton, but it's very soft. So it's different also than this one right here. We've got kind of three lining fabrics going on. Just a basic cotton here, this softer, more open weave here, and then this stiffer open weave here, which is why I was thinking this one may possibly be tarlatan. It's also possible that this did originally have more bones in it because as you can see here in the two darts we do sort of have channels where bones could have been there are no bones in there currently on this side however there is actually one bone still left right here it's super super short little bone and can we see the edge oh maybe i can only get it open this much but it looks like it is baleen that may have broken off a little bit at the top there so i see that white but that darker boning that's a sign of baleen I also do want to point out these tiny little stitches right here that are whipping closed this little panel here. I just love those tiny whip stitches, especially considering these running stitches are really pretty large, but the whip stitches, they're tiny. I'm also intrigued at the fact that over here, when we have our binding right here, this appears to be hand sewn. But if we keep going across, there's a section here where it changes thread color. So now we're on this brown thread color here. These look much more even, and I do wonder if they're actually machine stitched. And that brown continues the rest of the way across here. We do also have one hook and presumably an eye on the other side where we don't have any buttons and buttonholes down here. We do have one hook right on the waist, which again makes me think that maybe it was expected to be covered over with the belt. So taking a close look at the arm's eye, this is that stitching that I showed you from the exterior. Those stitches go through both sides, just this little like almost a crescent of hand stitches on the back panel only. So yeah, very interesting see those huge stitches where they whipped down the seam allowance there and here on the shoulder just to you know get it in place they didn't need to make it neat and that is just making it so that this doesn't fray at all it's not like attached down to the bottom it's just whipping it to the other side of the seam allowance Okay, I'm excited to show you that I just noticed one other thing that may be confirming my guess about this being strips that went over the shoulder and that is there is a remnant of thread curving up from the bottom here and then there were even a couple of pieces of thread left curving down to the front so i think that is what it was i think it was a decoration that would have gone here over and down So I figured you might like to know how large this tiny little lady is and I just measured the waist and the bust. She is 22 and a half inches around at the waist. She's about a 32 bust and then the distance from the bust to the waist or really from the armpit to the waist is only 
six and three quarter inches. So very, very short. And yeah, just a very tiny lady. Again, I'm excited to have learned, found those little thread marks that were inside to learn that this really did once go up like that. So it makes me wonder if it was something that they put on maybe at the beginning of the 1860s and then they quickly realized, oh shoot, that's not trendy anymore. Let's take that off. Or if maybe originally, maybe she even had other sleeves and maybe, I don't know, those markings in the back could have been left over from other sleeves. It's really hard to say. Frankly, you probably can even cut pagoda sleeves down into this look. I've never tried it, but I kind of figure if you, you know, take off this bell and then just close it up, maybe it can turn into a sleeve like this that was popular in the 1860s. So we could actually be looking at a sort of transitional garment right here even. So I hope that you have all enjoyed this deep dive into this lovely 160 year old lady. I am so thrilled that I was able to share this with you. I think it's just wonderful to look at antiques that are really so old. I mean, I love all of my antique collection, but I don't know, when you're going back that far, it just feels something different. I hope that you enjoyed this video and that you are looking forward to a lot more of this mid-Victorian content coming up over the next month or two because, again, I'm very excited for my upcoming 1850s project and for starting these deep dive decade videos that I'm going to be bringing you very, very soon. So if you liked this video, please go ahead and click the thumbs up icon. And if you'd like to see more videos like this from me, please go ahead and click subscribe and the little bell icon to be notified every time I post a new video. I do post videos here on YouTube twice a week with my sewing vlogs out on Tuesdays and other costuming content like this out on Saturdays, but I post every day over on my Instagram, so please go follow me on Instagram, that's at Lady Rebecca Fashions. And if you'd like to help support all of the work that I do on this channel, I do have a link to my Patreon and my Ko-fi down in the description below, or you can send me a super thanks right here on YouTube. I'd also like to take this time to thank all of my absolutely wonderful patrons who really, really keep all of the content on this channel coming to you all, especially those patrons at the Romantic, Victorian, and Edwardian level tiers who are Sharon, Mirage, Jean, Audra, Emily, Kim, Linda, Maria, Sarah, Tiffany, Cherries, Liz, Elizabeth, Kimberly, and Pita. Thank you all so, so much for all of your support, and thank you all for joining me today. If you want to watch a lot more of the Antiques Examining videos, I will link a playlist right up here and also down in the description. And otherwise, I hope that you all have a wonderful week, and I will see you very soon in my next video. Happy sewing!